All righty. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for taking time wherever you are in the world to join us today. Today's session is really focused on an information session, open house, if you will, for the 2023 Science Policy and Advocacy Certificate Program. It's here to answer the administrative logistic back end, give you sort of a glimpse as to what's to come if you're interested in applying or if you've already applied something to look forward to as well as to address any questions that are coming up because I know there's a lot of questions floating around and I want to make sure to address that to help make sure that this is a good fit for you. If you want to share with others, we're happy to invite them out. So we are ready to get started then. So just briefly, um, I'm happy to introduce myself. And then as I'm introducing myself, if you would like to sort of drop in the chat, uh, you know, what department you're coming from, what you're uh, a little bit about, whether you're from a PhD program, a master's program, undergrad program, um, I would love to see and read who is out there joining us today. So as you're doing that, my name is John. I am the program director for graduate professional success at UC Irvine. Um, I work with STEM PhDs and postdocs, and this program really started off um, with my predecessor, Harinder Singh, who if you heard in the policy space, he's fantastic, as well as working together with Adriana Bankston um, from Sigma Psi now and the Journal of Science Policy and Governments. And I'm pleased to be able to uh, share about the program today. I haven't seen any of the drops in there, but my background is in biomedical engineering. There you go. I see you all now. Thank you. I'm a, I, my background was in uh, biomedical engineering for our PhD program here at UC Irvine. Um, so I'm glad to be able to bring on the torch for the years to come. Welcome in Anu and Adihidi. Rebecca, hello, NIH, Jenna, Eva, Lana, welcome in. Great to see physics undergrad, biomarker developmental, that's wonderful. Get used to this, get used to introducing yourself. This is a community that we wanna build, so welcome in, thank you. Congratulations, Holly. All right, so jumping in just briefly into the background of where this program came from, as I mentioned, this really started off um, a few years ago where the program was developed through the Boros Wealth Welcome Fund that was awarded through the NSPN and UC Irvine's GPS STEM program that I'm the director of. And it was a program that incorporated public policy seminars, communication workshops, training working groups that were led by local advocacy groups, campus partners, and it really evolved into visits to Sacramento for us in California and others who were able to go out to Washington, D.C. to speak with policymakers. And the goals there were focused in on increasing knowledge and experience with public, with public policy processes, increasing knowledge and experience with advocacy related to science policy in particular, and develop the ability of trainees to communicate effectively with members in the policy arena. I know a lot of us are coming from STEM backgrounds and there's some type of magic that comes with that, a little bit of a black box for folks who aren't scientists. And this is a fantastic program for you to be able to deepen your communication skills and translate that black box magic into the what ifs and the so what's for the real world. And this really evolved into the certificate program that was developed in 2020 and 2021. So that was sort of the history of where we were and where we um, were able to evolve into. Um, just sort of, again, administrative back end, the purpose and objective of this program um, was founded in partnership with the Journal of Science Policy and Governments. Um, and this program is really meant to teach STEM PhDs and postdocs. We, I know we have some masters um, and undergrads here, but the STEM community, the essential skills required for a career in science policy. And we cover a full range of topics, including policy development, communication, resources, funding opportunities, networking, and career pathways. So giving you a chance to not just get the theoretical back end get the application, build out a portfolio, 
and finally build networking connections into the field that you're interested in building or even to say no to yourself like I thought I wanted this but that's not a good fit and so this is really a, a great beginners course as well as folks who are a little bit more intermediate and need a little bit more feedback and communication and skill um, and connections into the field um, it definitely is here to help build up those skill sets so we're asking you to construct a science policy elevator pitch for policymakers, writing a one pager or other types of documents like a policy memo and crafting a power mapping plan. So that way you know strategically how to speak with folks and who is sort of the power of influence. Um, and then finally, participate in our pitch competition as well as our writing competition. So ways for you to be able to build up your expertise uh, grow your network and really learn the fundamentals of science policy and advocacy from various resources. So just looking back a little about sort of the outcomes, um, we've had over 200 registrants over the years and 120 certi uh, certificate recipients. Um, overall, incredibly satisfied with the course and giving space for a comprehensive course full knowledge. You're welcome to see more of the details online, which I can share. Um, in the chat later or follow up in our email actually so you can see the nuances there but I just want to highlight really quickly the bottom line is people have truly enjoyed this course and this program and that's why we have such excitement to be able to bring this forward into this year and this summer in particular. Some other outcomes that are sort of more tangible from the program was that we were able to build out a science policy podcast through our GPS STEM radio. Um, here is one of our prominent speakers and actually curriculum builders, Adriana Bankston, who spoke on our podcast. And there's a lot of resources and, and of one journeys um, coming out from that podcast, as well as some of the folks who participated in our past years moved on to become AAAS fellows um, and or continue to found their own organizations, it's particularly Chia Chun, who became the founder of Science Policy and Advocacy Network at UCI, who we're now partnering with, um, and folks who are able to publish their op-eds and in, uh, become associate editors at the Journal of Science Policy and Governments. So, so many opportunities that were able to evolve from our participants here. This is just some of the highlights that you might be able to find yourself in down the line as you're participating. Just briefly, I um, just wanted to introduce the admin and curriculum team. I don't believe our curriculum team, all of our curriculum team is actually here with us, Adriana Bankston and Chia Chun. Um, but I know Amy, Amy Ralston is here today. She's jumping on, there she is. Do you wanna give a uh, just a quick introduction of yourself, Amy? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. I am a PhD candidate in physics. So I work with primarily astronomy data sets studying galaxies. And I'm also going to be taking the course with y'all. So I'm really interested in getting into science policy. I recently found out it was even an option for someone studying physics, and it seems like a great one. So I'm going to be doing back end administration and other coordination tasks, kind of like I'll be the TA and the student at the same time. <laughs> she run, she's running a double duty, but uh, I'm so incredibly grateful to have extra hands on deck, especially being able to manage a larger class size. Um, and again, we're here for your education. We're here to be able to help facilitate the learning aspects of it. And um, I will be the primary touch point. Amy will be supplementary supporting anything else that I have loose ends that I need to tie up. Um, and she will be the primary individual sending out emails, sending out reminders, and making sure that we have a fluid experience um, as well as supporting the rest of the team. So I am incredibly grateful to have Amy on board, as well as Adriana and Chia Chun. They are an incredible team to work with. I'm so excited to be able to get in, uh, have you guys get connected with them and to work with them as well. Excited too. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. So Again, more of the logistics stuff, just a high level schedule of what you're looking at. Um, I'm just going to really touch on the high, uh, the highlights. July 11th is our kickoff day, a short course orientation, just to sort of get through the nitty gritty of the schedule itself. 
um, some Q&A, but we're really focusing and jumping straight into examples of scientific research policy where you're taking that STEM background that you have that is so incredibly beautiful and seeing it in action from a scientific research policy perspective. And then moving into more of how do you actually apply your scientific knowledge in advocacy strategies, communication for public policies, um, and how do you start to get a little bit more narrow in your targeting so that you have a message that is effective to a particular niche and or market that you're looking at that needs to hear your message? And in order um, to hear it, um, how can they then make the changes afterwards? And really building up the skill sets for you. So the writing aspects, giving you time to build out your elevator pitches, um, giving you time to hear from a panel of policymakers, scientists who have made it into made it a career, um, as well as folks who have been able to make transitions using fellowship opportunities, internship opportunities, um, and then sort of rounding all of this out with more practical application, building your portfolio, building your skill sets with practical guide of how to talk to decision makers. Um, and then we round out with a celebration of you all announcing our writing winners, having our pitch competition of 10 to 15 folks who we picked throughout the program. Um, and finally, you know, if you will, a soft ceremony of those graduating with your certificates. So this is a time where we have it open to all the folks to join public and those who are in this program to celebrate your successes and your learned lessons. So, Again, more logistics. The assignments that you're looking at really are four primary components, an elevator pitch video, which you have two drafts of, and this comes in sort of the sequential order that we intend to see it come in as, a writing piece like an op-ed or a memo, um, power mapping, a one-pager, and again, the elevator pitch video and writing piece. You'll get reviews, you get feedback, and you get to enhance and reiterate on that to make sure it's elevated from what you started out with, getting feedback from folks who will point out things that you might have missed and or things that you might have shared that are too in-depth with jargon that an individual who's coming from a general perspective may not be able to understand and really craft and hone in on this portfolio pieces that you can add to be able to apply to your fellowships, internships, and our future career moving forward. Of course, we have competition with prizes and the prizes are yet to be announced, but again, I'll emphasizing that this is a fun way to be able to get you guys to build something and then to have it be meaningful at our elevator pitch competition. We invite policymakers local um, to Irvine as well as globally if they're available, um, as well as other folks who are in decision making roles who will sort of help you understand how someone might receive that type of message, especially if they don't have the scientific background that you do, but understand what needs to be said in order to make a decision policy-wise, um, high-level and or administrative-wise. And then we also have writing piece competition for folks who want to focus in on that type of skill set and work your magic there. So again, we're here to celebrate, here to be able to create um, if you will, a fun environment to learn these types of skill sets. Just wanted to give some highlights as to some examples of the assignments that you'll be looking at. So on the left is the power mapping, um, who, where you'll be placing individuals, organizations as to where they stand in relation to the goal that you're looking at. And then to the right, we have an example of your one pager. And this was the one that I saw to be incredibly helpful. It's a great um, both imagery and visual, as well as a teaching point to be able to emphasize how policy and science have a crossroads of change that can happen just simply from a one, piece, one piece of paper, if you will, that you're able to hand out and deliver your message succinctly. So we do have some pitch uh, examples. 
You can find all of them on our YouTube page on our science policy and advocacy for STEM scientists, um, as well as the policy elevator pitch competition flyer that we have here. And I'm going to actually go ahead and play one of the videos just so you have a sense of it. These are really quick. It's meant to deliver information um, in, a, in a way that's effective and concise to policymakers. So I'm going to go ahead and get that switched over for you. Hello, Representative Cooper. I'm a PhD candidate and diabetes researcher at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in your district, and I'm asking you to support legislation proposing to place an essential financial cap on out-of-pocket monthly costs for insulin. This legislation would release financial and psychological burdens on patients in your district that visit Vanderbilt and other medical facilities around Tennessee for imperative diabetes care. Currently, insulin prices are skyrocketing, leading individuals to even sell their homes in order to afford a life-saving drug that's needed on a daily basis. This Miracle Therapeutics Centennial Anniversary is 2021, this year, but it is merely too costly for some patients to afford. Insulin itself has not changed much in 100 years, but the cost of insulin has unjustifiably skyrocketed with an increase of more than 500%. Without insulin, an individual will succumb to a painful, drawn out, and most importantly, unnecessary death. On average, someone is diagnosed with diabetes every 21 seconds. I have been researching diabetes at the laboratory bench and have done clinical experience that cultivates a greater understanding of patients' needs. From these experiences, I have learned the striking impact of diabetes, not only on biological processes, but also on an individual's everyday life. This further drives my passion to disseminate the absolute necessity of accessible and affordable insulin treatment. A solution to increase insulin affordability and accessibility is an essential and pressing solution to get a life-saving therapeutic into the hands of diabetes patients without the financial and psychological burdens currently in place. And just to remind you, roughly 10 people were diagnosed with diabetes during the course of our discussion alone. How many of those people are going to go without insulin today? Can I count on you to support legislation for your constituency's diabetic needs? And that is just one of many that we have. That's examples that you can check out. Um, let me get our slides back. All righty. So with the frequently asked questions that I've seen and I've heard of, and this is now where we're moving to towards the Q&A section. Um, when does this start and end? Well, this starts in July 11th, uh, Tuesdays till September 19th. And what time is it? It'll run between 3 to 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, and can international students attend? Yes. But this will be a synchronous class. It's, I have to admit, this is my first time going through this. Um, and so because reviewers need time to be able to review the material and provide feedback, um, the teaching team will try, will be trying our best to make sure that the videos get posted as soon as possible to help facilitate the learning. And I understand that um, not everyone will be able to attend at that time, but we do ask that you align yourself with the schedules, especially with the assignments in order to get feedback. I've been asked often about how much time does it take for this program, and in particular, to be successful. Um, it's about an hour and a half every week for class uh, and three to five hours per week to watch the pre-course videos and assignments. And this really kind of depends. Um, the assignment, for example, especially like the one pager that you saw or the writing assignments, those might take a little bit more time to be able to conduct the research behind it and to be able to cohesively write, you know, a four to five pages for the writing assignment, the op, the, um, op ed memo piece, um, and or to craft, you know, some of the beautiful illustrations that might come into a one pager to make a visually appealing image. 
And that can go above and beyond the time that we're asking here. But in general, to get to learn and to build the portfolio, I think you can be really successful with about seven hours a week. I will catch your question soon at the end. Um, and to continue with other FAQs, um, when will I know that I'm accepted? If you have applied by today, um, we, you should know by June 23rd. And then if you're applying by the extended deadline of June 23rd, you should know by June 27th. And we should be sending out statuses to folks to let them know. And we're really looking for individuals who are eager to learn and want to join in this space. And they have a strong reason that they want to pursue because we have a limited amount of resources and time as well as slots available, um, but we are here to be able to celebrate and to help facilitate the learning opportunities. I just want to briefly acknowledge that this program came from before I joined into my current role, especially through Harinder Singh, Adriana Bankston, and Melissa. Adriana and Melissa are still working with us. Chia Chun and our coordinators, um, Clevi and Ria, have continued to uh, support us through there. I believe they mostly have graduated. Chia Chun is still with us through SPAN. Um, and then I want to give a thank you to our 2023 coordinators, Adriana Bankston, Chia Chun to help with the curriculum, Amy to help with the logistics and administrative backend, and of course our collaborators, Melissa, Courtney, Stephen, Dr. Singh, from um, all different walks of organizations. So with that, you know, I'm open for questions and you're welcome to reach out to me. All of the information is readily available on our website. I'll be dropping in some links um, into the chat here if you would like to get more information, but you're welcome to come off mute or to ask in the chat some questions. Um, and I will address, is it in she? In she? Um, are, only, are students only uh, allowed to apply and how about early career researchers? Uh, you're welcome to apply as early career researchers. Um, again, we're looking for individuals who are willing to commit the time and are sort of at that, they're not too experienced because then I think a lot of this fundamentals wouldn't be helpful. Um, that would be probably the only caveat. So if you can express your excitement and uh, you're able to uh, demonstrate that this would actually be helpful for you, I think you'd be a fabulous fit. 